man, I, I just, I gotta know. I, and I ask this question a lot. I'm not going to ask you specifically how much money you've made. That's for everybody else. Yeah. I respect you too much. <laughs> I don't know how to frame this question. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Courage and Nade Shot Show live from the 100 Thieves Cash App Compound. I said Cash App the right way, right? Cash App Compound. It's a little bit of a play on words there. Wow, this uh, is an air that I'm not typically normal. Uh, I don't expect or see very often. I didn't have often. caffeine today. You didn't have? Oh, I wait. have a little bit of lingering headache right now. From I thought you were still off caffeine. I was, but then I got back on a little bit, and now I'm kind of bouncing in and out. But that's neither here nor there, because guess what? Today, live from Los Angeles, California, we have a... Very special guest in the flesh. Now, we always have our little breakdowns about everyone and things we need to know and our sponsor reads. So I could go into the little facts, but what I do know is this. Our guest today is infinitely better at Tim the Tap Man than competitive shooter games. He is a man of mystery, as you never know what he's going to dive into next. Is it extreme weightlifting? Is it his expansive shoe collection that he continues to add more onto? Or is it his love for puppies? As we've seen uh, you, uh, him foster foster parent right it, yeah. earlier this year, so mm -hmm. uh, our guest today is none other than Zed himself, Anton. Welcome to the show. Your official yeah, word says yeah, hold on. Grammy Award winning DJ, record producer, songwriter, over 17 songs charting on the Billboard Hot 100. He has over 13 million combined followers on Twitter and Instagram, and a brand new song out now called Grip uh, or wait, with Griff called Inside Out. I don't know why I got Ooh. that backwards. Hello. That's the official <laughs> intro. Okay, I feel like nobody so cares about that because I, I foster puppies. See, exactly. So hey, we might as well cut to that. I, I bet some people probably care about That's a Grammy. True. That is <laughs> That's true. fair. Yeah. That's fair. No disrespect. No. No disrespect. Yeah. Puppies are better, though, than a Grammy. Man, we should win a Grammy once. It's probably easy. Well, <laughs> it's not hard. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. <laughs> I mean, it for some people here, but if no, I knew no, how to no, no, win no. a Grammy, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing right now. <laughs> Dude, that is true. We, were just, we actually just got done watching uh, 100 Thieves Valor, which I know we'll get into on the show today, but Anton, you said something crazy as before you were about to film this. I was about to ask you what you've been doing in quarantine, but you just asked, you just said that you haven't listened to any music in the last seven months. Like you've just been listening yeah. to podcasts. Yeah. And this is your first ever podcast. This is my first ever podcast. I wanted to wait and not do anything until my next album comes out, which is still ways away, but mm -hmm. I love you guys. So I figured let's just do it now. I appreciate that so much. He said that he was, he was holding out for the Joe Rogan podcast. Courage and HR Never show. heard of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Brother, deadpan delivery on that was perfect. Have they ever won it. the Tempest Award for the best podcast? We just did. <laughs> Hell yeah, brother. We won an award. Let's we go. won an award, guys. We're doing this shit out here. But no, this has me really excited because, dude, I tell you, the first time that I really got to meet you and, and hang out was at your show in New York. Yes. It was close to New Year's probably two years ago now. Um, and we went with yeah. Tim. Tim's yeah. wife and uh, family and another friend of Tim's. And I was blown away because we were hanging out and talking mm -hmm. until like two minutes before your show. And you're like, and someone walked in like, Anton, you're on a 90 seconds. You're like, oh, okay, guys, I'm going to go. Let's keep this conversation going <laughs> after the show. You ran out. Before I could even make it to the venue, I look up on stage. You're like, everybody, we're live in Brooklyn. How are we doing? I'm like, we were just fucking talking about Overwatch with that guy. Yeah. about What he thinks about Reinhardt. And now yep. here he is. Dude, you just went right into it. I mean, you've been doing this for so long that it's like natural, huh? Yeah, we kind of, sometimes I play venues where the walk to stage is somewhat complicated. Mm -hmm. Like, I played a show, I don't remember where it was, but it was basic, oh, I think it was in Philippines. Mm -hmm. And it was at a indoor pool. So like a pool, think indoor pool theme park with like a huge globe over it. And the stage is there, and there's no other way than like to go through half the crowd. And then they're like, "Yeah, we're gonna have security guards, like, you know, keep space for you." Mm. And that's hard because then I was like, I had my team do the walk, and like, okay, it's gonna be 35 seconds. So in my head, I'm like counting okay, on this note. I gotta start walking, but if I need like two or three seconds of buffer, and like mm -hmm. sometimes it's hard. I have a Vegas residency. I should actually say I had a Vegas residency because due to COVID, that yeah. doesn't exist. But I know exactly the amount of steps and like at countdown 10, the door opens. Like it's a thing that you know. Oh, yeah. That one, if I remember, we had our little trailer right behind the stage, yep. like outside of the building. So I was like, ah, it's not going to take me that long. So I was like, I'll see you guys. Walk straight on stage. Yep. But yeah, we do it so much that 
my team lets me know how many steps it's going to take me to get on stage because otherwise I'm yeah. going to be late and it's happened to me where I was literally on the wrong floor and the first song was already playing. How, what, how old were you when you did your first show? Um, well, my first concerts were as a pianist back in Germany when I was like five or six or something like oh, that. Oh, wow, okay. So I was, and it was like playing in schools and playing in churches and mm. stuff like that. I did that as a kid and then my first concert with a band was when I was 12. That was like band, you know, people come to see you kind of stuff. So the level yeah. of confidence on stage has just been there from, from the get-go because I know that you play in some massive venues in front of hundreds of thousands of people, I bet, in some festivals, right? Yes, I still get nervous. Okay, okay. And yeah. not, I don't know, I think that partially it's a good thing, but the nervousness has always been there and now it's more of like, I mean, everybody's fell at some point on the way to stage. Like, all these things happen, like yep. some technical difficulties. I've played a huge show in Mexico. That was my first big show. I think it was like 12,000 people or something like that. It was a pretty big hall. And it wasn't the most professional way to build a stage and everything. So, like, first two songs, amazing. I love it. And then, and then the sound stops. And that's, like, the worst thing that can happen on stage. So you're, like, alone on stage. And you just start check like a checklist, like this thing doesn't get power. This, and then you start looking, and you're like, "What the hell is going on?" And every you look around, and everybody's like, well, "I don't know what happened." Like I'm not on stage. And then it's just like some loose cable unplugged somewhere underneath the table, and you just stand there like an idiot. It's the oh, worst man. part. Dude, I, I hate be, that. I would be so, I'd be so nervous in a moment like that. I mean, I've been to festivals where, and then next thing you know, the crowd starts making their own noise or chant and stuff. Yeah, and your whole, you're probably just sweating, bro. When my like stream buffers frames, I'm like, shit, shit. <laughs> shit. I'll be I'm honest like, with you. How do I fix this? I don't know how you guys do it. Like, maybe because I've done what I do for so long, it gets to a point, like, I'm still nervous, but when I'm on stage, I don't know what to compare to, but I'm in my own world. Like, you have to wake me up from that. Mm -hmm. um, but I've streamed a few times, and it's really hard. Like, it's, I feel like I've just worked out. After I turn the stream oh, yeah. off, I'm like, oh, yeah. so hard. I mean, like, you've talked about this a lot of times. Matt, Matt, will, Matt will come to me, and because... Matt, Matt, what Matt does so much better than me is the creative YouTube video mm -hmm. side. What I think I do very well is like the, I can keep my energy going Entertaining. for eight to 10 hours and yeah, I'm done with it do and that. then I can still keep going. That's crazy. But Matt's been to me before, Matt, Matt, will, you'll do like what, an eight, a six hour, eight hour stream and you'll be like on the couch, like I'm ready to. Well, yeah. I mean, when I was in my competitive career, I wasn't really streaming. I was just broadcasting our, our scrims and our practice. That's fair. So it really wasn't like I was trying to entertain. And yeah. ever since I retired, I obviously want to be more entertaining. And I make it past four hours, and I'm like, man, I'm gassed. I, yeah. I just don't have the personality. I'm not always happy. Like, yeah. I'm not just always excited to be everywhere I'm at and happy with who I am. Yeah, like, yeah I'm yeah. just if I get in a bad mood, I get in a bad mood, and I gotta shut down and turn off the stream. Yeah, yeah. I feel you. Happens. Happens to the best of us. But so, how like, you guys can do this every day is like, I have to plan it a week ahead, and then I'm like, I just gotta do this. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna stream now. You like practice starting the hard. stream. Hey guys. <laughs> it's also not to say anything wrong because. In 2020, oh, yeah. you know, it's not about your intention. We know that. It's not about what you were trying to say. Mm -hmm. It's about what you said. And then we're like, okay, I acknowledge I said this. I didn't actually mean it. Like, it came out wrong. Yeah. I would like to, like in a conversation, if I say something, you're like, no, right, scratch that. I didn't mean that. That doesn't exist on the internet yeah, because people are like, clips and shit. I know you don't mean this, but you said this, so therefore I'm going to hold you accountable. to. And even worse, things change in society things change and let's just say you said something 10 years ago you didn't mean or that was okay and and then five years later you're like god why did i say that exactly. i was so stupid five years from then it's like found you done, done that's for. you right this is you like you sat there and like yeah i don't mean Nuts. that but do you put a lot of pressure on yourself in that case uh in, in, in the way that you think about media opportunities or streaming mm -hmm. more or going on podcasts mm -hmm. is it something that you're proactively thinking about yeah i i would lie if i said no because um, I'm very opinionated, and like I said, I listen to so many podcasts, and um, I think, when was this? Like, just after Trump got elected was the first time when I started feeling politically very engaged mm -hmm. and enraged at the same time. Yeah. And everybody was like, you should just stay out of that. Like, my own team, publicists, are like, you shouldn't talk about this. It's going to alienate your fans. And I'm like, you know what? That's fine. Like, I would rather have half the amount of fans than be somebody I'm not. Yeah. And if somebody is unwilling to listen to my music because of my opinion in politics or something like that, then that's never it. even been a fan. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just like I listen to podcasts usually with people I may disagree with. 
to understand their point of view. I do the exact opposite. It's like, tell me. I want to understand why you like this X, Y, Z yeah. that I don't like. And oftentimes you realize that, you know what? You're not that far away. You're not that far apart from each other. It's just that you have this competitive, like, I got to make this person look bad. This person's got to make me look bad. It's mm. just what's going on in the world right now. It's like everybody pointing fingers at it's each like other. Combative. Instead yeah. of just kind of focusing on, you know, doing the best we can together and understanding each other. Well, you're clearly very articulate and, and quite intelligent to be able to dissect Thank those you. thoughts and present them the way that you just did. So. I try. Yeah. I, I try. But it still worries me, like streaming specifically. Yeah. A podcast, again, this is my first one, but I've had conversations like this. Hey, guess what? We can cut anything out that you want. <laughs> so say, say, say it all. <laughs> but when I stream, I'm doing something else. I'm gaming and I'm like focused and then I'm reading chat and I'm like trying to read that and then I'm thinking and then... I'm worried I'm just going to say something I didn't mean and there's no reversing it because, you yeah. know, I've been doing, like, try juggling and, like, yeah. doing a backflip at the same time and answering difficult questions. You may say something you didn't necessarily mean. Oh. And then there's, people, yeah. there's people donating $5 with a name that's trying to get you to say, like, oh, it's Mike Hunt. Literus. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. Mike, <laughs> Mike Hunt. You're like, oh, Mike Literus, thank you so much. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. It's amount of times I've done that there. in my life. So that's, like, just part of your day then, right? Dealing oh. with that. I'll I mean, tell you what, though, yeah. for me and what I can tell you, it, it, in the same way that you say you still get nervous when you're being on, when you're doing a set and you're on stage, I, I see streaming as completely different. It is definitely a muscle that you build. Okay. Uh, it gets easier and that. easier and easier. And then mm -hmm. in your own world, you don't put as much pressure on yourself to be reading the chat constantly or getting to the donations. Mm. The people that are watching, if they choose to donate, they choose to sub. I don't think that they should always instantaneously expect like a reaction out of the streamer. Yeah. So it really should be more about you sharing an experience that you really like to share like with that. others with video games. Um, and I wouldn't I like put that. as much pressure on yourself. It's definitely, yeah. it's it's up here, but it's a muscle that you build and you, you don't start to stress as much as you do now. I, I can totally relate to music because <clears throat> while I see myself as an artist first because I came from making music and not from playing other people's music like a DJ does, mm -hmm. Um, at first I felt the need to always kind of, oh, I play a song like, you guys are not really happy, huh? I should change that song up. Yeah. And now, like the shows that you've seen, I'm way past that point to the point like, you guys chose to come here and I'm going to show you what I prepared and this is my story for you. And if you don't like it, you always have the option to leave, but this is what I spent so much time and money making for you, right? So I don't feel like I need to, oh, you don't like that song? Well, Another song's gonna eventually come. Yeah. You know, I, I can't mean? imagine what that feels like because when I'm in an Uber on the way to the club and I've got the aux cord, I'm like <laughs> pressure around. on. <laughs> like I got three people in this car. Like, oh, you You're guys nervous. aren't fucking with that. Yeah, y'all ain't buy with that. No, I got this next one. I got you. This next one. I'll, I'll tell you, it was a lesson in 2011. I learned that. That was my first tour. It was with Skrillex. I was like, I had 11,000 followers on Facebook, like a thousand on Twitter. Yeah, very very beginning stages and. I noticed that you can play music that's weird that people would think is not cool, but if you are really confident and if you present whatever you present very confidently, people will enjoy it or at least be open to it. So Sonny was like, Skrillex was like, I don't think anything works. I was like, well, give me, like, what should I play? And then I played I Like to Move It, which is like, I love it, right? Yeah. But it's like in, in our sets wasn't really it. So I play it confidently like i look at the crowd like this shit is it <laughs> and i ended up playing it for like five years every night because it was amazing it. and yeah. people love it and it's like i feel like the cool thing about a show is that people forget their prejudice people forget they're like i don't like this artist blah 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 when they're there there's thousands of people around everybody's smiling like fuck it i'll sing along to that song like we're gonna have a good time oh yeah and there's I mean, something nice about that am i, am I mistaken to think I, is i like to i like to move, move it yeah, yeah yeah for yeah. sure yeah. i just think about them uh cute little penguins from that movie madagascar yeah. madagascar really quick i i know we're gonna i have a question for, oh, for Anton. i have questions with. too so but, read the cash okay well first off Make a, do a short one cash app we love you we're gonna i got so many things to ask my mind is spinning okay good well cash app as you guys know presenting sponsor of the courage and nature show one of our great sponsors quicker uh, quicker quicker you don't use cash app then fuck you uh cash app is great follow them on twitch twitch out to be slash cash app you can go see different people uh use promo code t-h-i-e-v-e-s thieves when downloading cash app you get ten dollars and ten dollars gets donated to the gamers outreach foundation that helps kids get gaming carts in hospitals when dealing with long-term treatment again co promo code thieves t-h-i-e-v-e-s in the cash app or google play store or the app store google play store today can i go really quick 
Oh, yeah, but I, I get to go next. Okay, this is a quick one, though. Cause, <laughs> it's like I'm in line behind one person. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so, <laughs> Brett and Yuri uh, is a buddy of ours that we met through gaming as well. Super mm-hmm. incredibly talented. When I went to his show in Austin, Texas. Um, this guy's just flexing all over the place today. Flexing no, I'm kidding. Today. I'm okay, kidding. Okay, kick kidding. rocks, kid. Um, I went to his show in Texas, and he would make jokes about he he would go out and then, and do his whole performance and then end and but then come back out for an encore which was like his most famous three songs or whatever okay. the ones that people always like play that song come mm-hmm. on and I believe it's uh like I write sins not tragedies and um that he's done for fifteen years you know then and, and it's like fuck here we go again and he was uh-huh. making a joke about that like here it is here's the song y'all came for uh-huh. is there like a song of yours that you're like here we go time to do the song that everyone like that, that you're tired not. of? No, absolutely not. And I don't understand artists who, because I know artists that I really respect who are like, I hate. They play like a short version of their hit going into something else. And I'm like, huh, that's so weird. Like, yeah, I am most proud of all of my songs. That's the moments I'm looking for to play. Like, mm-hmm. I play other songs because I'm excited about them and they're new and fresh. But ultimately, my favorite moments are playing my own music. And the bigger the song, the more I enjoy it. So I don't really understand why people don't like. Maybe they should have not made that song the way it is if they don't like it yeah you know what i mean it's a weird thing but i know it's a real thing because a lot of artists are like i'm just saying i have to play this song against never been like that for me you're proud of your work i'm super proud of my work and i release way less than 90 percent, 95 percent of people in my world like i you know in the last three or four years i released like one or two songs a year while yeah. people like almost released an album a year but i'm really proud of that song and when it comes out every millisecond of that is perfect mm. and I would have not wanted to change anything and I will make new versions and new versions until it's perfect so when it's out I'm perfectly fine with it the way it is yeah well I get to go next you're right. all right look hit me listen man I'm, I'm sorry if any of these are ignorant questions that people ask you all the time but I, I'll tell you what this is very genuine I had a conversation it must have been a couple months ago just about DJs in general I feel mm. like in the last 10 years there's nobody in this world in like any industry that whose lives are crazier than DJs, right? Obviously, this is pre-COVID. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you have a residency. Uh, you know, when you have projects come out, you go and do tours. And it is just mind-blowing to me, the schedule that you guys are on, going show mm. to show, country to country. You're talking about you going to the Philippines. You're talking about going to Mexico. Uh, so many different places internationally. What is the craziest, like, turnaround uh, leg of a trip that you've ever done where you're just like, fuck this, I can't do it anymore? There was one time when I had a show in LA and I had a show in China. So doable, you know, with the, if you mind the time difference. However, there was a second show edit in LA. I was like, well, you can just do kind of both. And then you go to China. And I was like, yeah, I mean, I'm here. I might as well do two shows. However, the people scheduling the show, not my agent who schedules all, it it went through my label and they may have not been as familiar with this kind of stuff, they forgot about the time difference. So ultimately, I promised I'm going to do the show. I want to say it was like a free show as well, but I promised and gave my word to do it. And the problem was that they forgot the time difference. So it ended up, I had to play LA, fly to China, play China, get straight back on the plane, go back to LA and play the second LA show. Or I had to disappoint a whole lot of people. That was painful. (laughs) <laughs> oh my god that is before i got banned from china I, but yeah I, I can't oh fast. That no, I, I want to get into that really oh, quickly shit but oh shit i forgot listen and i mean this in the nicest way possible wait are we when, gonna get banned from china no no we can't, <laughs> we can't be banned from china we got too much riding on this uh my question would be do you, you ever play the game monopoly of course when you go and do a show do you feel like you just pass go and collect the 200 dollars, <laughs> but a much bigger bag I mean, it's like when I think about DJs and, mm. you know, uh, someone as prominent as you, I'm sure that we can all assume that you're making a pretty penny yeah. from these shows that of you're course. doing. No doubt. And you probably pack as many as you can in, <laughs> obviously without trying to, you know, dilute the quality of the music that you're making and experience people get at shows. But, mm-hmm. man, I, I, ju- I got to know. I, and I ask this question a lot. I'm not going to ask you specifically how much money you've made. That's for everybody else. Yeah, I respect you too much. <laughs> I don't know how to frame this question. Go ahead. What Hit is it. like, what? I can't. I can't do it. I can't do, do it. Do it in know. a soft way, and I'll. I'll I was take, trying I'll... to think of a soft way to do it. Like in that in that leg, you went from L.A. to China to L.A. Yeah. In your mind, what did it? Have you ever just become numb to the money, or were you thinking no. yourself when you finally get on that last leg back to mm-hmm. L.A.? You're like, 
Oh, I did it. I did it. No, I mean, I'm so much money. I'm almost sure, and I would have to look exactly at the show it was, but it was like a show that I did not make money from. Oh, shit. Yeah. It was like, so oftentimes we will play radio shows, which are, you know, my show is me and an opener or two. Um, I play for 90 minutes or 120 minutes, and openers play for an hour. A radio show is like six hours long, and there's like 30 artists, and everybody plays five to 15 minutes, and the headliner yep. maybe plays 30. So it's a different format. And of course, they're not going to be able to pay every artist their fee because they would be broke, or the tickets would have to be obnoxious because they have Taylor Swift going into One Direction, going to me, going to Calvin. It's like lineups you would not normally get. And everybody reduces their fees down to like bare, barely able to cover the cost. So that show, I, I'm almost 100% sure I didn't make any money on. Wow. And when For the it's love like of the game, <laughs> meaning flying to China isn't just me, right? That's going to be like a crew of ten people having to go back and forth. So I feel bad about everybody having to do this. And we have some tall people in my team, and for them, it's like no fun to sit anywhere for fifteen, sixteen hours since to go straight back. Um, but yeah, I've done some, I've done some crazy things for sure, like this. But in the moment, no matter how stressful the schedule is, oftentimes we plan like a year ahead, right? And then they send you all the schedules. You look at that. It's like, yeah, that looks fun. That looks awesome. Love that venue. Love this city. Love this country. Six months later, you're like, how many more countries? How many more? <laughs> you know, because but back then you were fit. You're like, yeah, I can do it. Yeah. But now you have two choices. You pull through or you disappoint a lot of people. So usually I'll take like, I'll just take it and I'll just go through it. And of course, the money is, is another point of that. But not the hardest things I do in my career make me no money. My hard ticket tours, which you saw like a fraction of it. It wasn't like my proper tour. We spent like almost two months programming the light. Every single light. Every single light for every single song. The color. The sh like how fast it turns on. How slow it turns off. The fade in. The fade out. The, the movement. Like we built the whole production in a warehouse, in, which was like 200 grand a week or something crazy. Holy just to like cow, prepare man. to get good at the, the tour. Yeah. By the time you play it. You can barely cover your costs. So, and I make my tickets so low so that anybody can. And I mean, they're still like, you know, thirty to fifty dollars, but that's like the bare minimum we can do to cover our costs. And most of my tours, I don't think I ever ended up making money on those. Wow. Because if I know I'm gonna make more money, I'm gonna want more production. You know, and then at some point you're like, yeah, we can't afford that, and that's when I know, okay, this is about as much you as know, I can do. Sounds like Mr. Beast, dude. Uh, dude, I was about to say we just had Mr. Beast on our podcast last uh -huh. week. Who, if, if I don't know if you know who Mr. Yeah, Beast yeah, is, I yeah. Do. So, so. Mm -hmm. His mentality is, if I make, let's just put a number on it. If I make a million dollars this month, 990,000 of it's going back into my videos to elevate them to the next level, to then make smart. 2 million, to then put 1,990,000 into, the, you know. Very so smart. hearing that is very similar. You know, I, I got to experience your Zed in the Park, uh, yeah. which was an awesome I was show. I to go to that. That was such a blast. Mm. And for me, my thought with that, and when Maddie and I were leaving, we were like, if I was in an artist's shoes and you're mentioning how that's like rare because they don't really let anyone do shows in that that park it was that new yeah yeah mm -hmm. and i was like i would do shows like that where i would barely make any money off of it just because of how fun i mean you had that whole back area where everyone yeah had drinks. it was, it like, was phenomenal you were, i was we were having conversations and it was like oh this friend's here this friend's here. yeah and it just seemed like it was like your birthday party but yeah it was oh. you know like on a show like that is that just like again an example of for the love of the love of the game, like yeah, there's the, the the financial side, but I mean, there were thousands of people there, and absolutely. I yeah. mean, the way you have to see it, it, finance finance and touring music, unless you get to like the four nights at Staples level, yeah. you know, or stadium level, is this: when you rent your production, whatever that is, you pay weekly. Mm -hmm. So, if you want to just do one set in the park, you're gonna pay for a week. If you want to do seven set in the parks, you're gonna pay for a week. So the math is like. You want to try and play as many shows in a week as you can to to you know limit your costs because you pay the same thing anyway. And of course, there's excep exceptions to that, but that's the rule. Uh, so doing any event like Zed in the Park is of course not going to be as lucrative as if I did two Zed in the Parks, which is maybe something I would do in the future, two nights back to back. Yeah, that literally sp splits your cost in half. Um, so that's why touring makes sense because you built this huge production. I built this ring, which is really expensive to build. That thing's crazy. You know, that it's thing like is spaceship. awesome. Yeah, and you want to like get as many shows in as you can to 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 pay for that. So one ups, Zed in the Park is for the love of it, and I wanted to have you know have a Vegas residency, and I was dreaming of having like these three or four in the parks, like L.A., 
New York, Chicago, maybe like find a couple places, Japan. Um, oh, and God. yearly, yeah. instead of being a part of like a random show or a festival, people know they like the first one we did the 3rd of July, like right before 4th of July. It's like, hey, just know, right? The way you know 4th of July is then know the night before you can go to Zed in the Park and have a good time with your friends and eat food, like Smart. all the games we had set up and everything. So my, my mentality was I want to introduce this into a thing that people have in their minds like oh it's soon that time so yeah we've done it twice so far which was phenomenal but yeah. my, my goal is to keep going and like keep building this bigger and bigger and oh it totally will uh so listen been to a ton of countries good looking guy very successful well known throughout the world you've been everywhere i gotta ask which country has most beautiful women Sweden, I think. Takes, Sweden? Yeah. Okay. Have you been to Sweden? I've never been to Sweden. I mean, generally, if I take Sweden as my go-to example for countries that do things well. I don't know how if I agree with that in regards to the COVID response, but yes. other than that, I feel like Sweden is my... Why can't we be like Sweden? Like, Sweden does <laughs> that. Why can't that we yeah. like Sweden? Let's do that. that. They're outside of the playground playing. Like, and they're <laughs> like, you go through Sweden, everybody speaks English. Every single person. Like, they... They all are good looking and like guys, girls, they're all tall. And you're like, why are you guys all so perfect? <laughs> like, what do I do to do that? No, um, I had Sweden, to ask. Yeah, well, I, I had know. to ask. I'm sure there's kids at home that are wondering the same things. Oh, dude, I, I know. Uh, I think you tweeted out, um, I'm pretty sure it was you, about uh, your fans from Japan mm. recently because I went to Japan last year. I believe we talked about it a bit because mm -hmm. I was so looking forward to it. I know how much you love Japan. And he pulled up in the Charizard hoodie. Exactly. Which I want right. to ask you about Pokemon. You're, deck, right you're now. decked out too. Um, what is it like? I, I can't wait for Matt to go to Japan because Matt yes. loves anime. Matt loves. Oh my god! He would. He, I know he would absolutely love it. Do you like anime? I am not a big anime damn, person. Damn, damn. What do you yeah. love about Japan so much? Like, what is it? There's for you? so much. Well, let's start with food, just because I love Japanese food. Yeah. Easy topic to easy to get on board. So good. What I love is that people are super professional. Mm -hmm. And um, what's very normal is let's say we play a show in a different country where we don't travel with our own production. Like when we do our US tours, we have five trucks, you know, the rings and everything breaks down to five trucks. They go to from A to B, the same crew builds them every day. When we go to, from Japan to LA or whatever, we can't obviously do that, right? So yep. we send very detailed, very specific specs on how far each thing is apart from each other, you know, how far the microphone is from the edge of the desk, every single thing. And they get done somewhat, and you show up, and like, you guys didn't read this, did you? just kind of like looked at the pictures, and then you go to Japan, and it's flawless. They take so much pride Every, in their work. And yeah, because any job in the culture. Anything. They, they, they pride take in pride in doing the best they can, and I, I absolutely adore that. I think I always, that's my mentality is no matter what you do in, in Team Z, even if you just wave hello, I want you to want to be the best at waving hello. Mm -hmm. You know, just. If you want to be the best, then you're right for this job. And I feel like in Japan, people take a lot of pride in being really good at what they do, and I, I, I admire that. And they're so friendly, yeah. just so respectful. They will never put you in an uncomfortable situation like some other countries in, in press situations like that. Um, I just love so much about Japan. It's unique. It's, I mean, you, you, it's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> it's like colorful. Yeah. Uh, it's exciting, uh, polite. Educated. I don't know. I, I love. I love everything. They, they, about Japan. they turn up there, man. They drink. Oh they, my they god! Fun, I saw the revolution in Japan myself. Yeah. Like I've never seen. Maybe China would be another place where I saw things develop like crazy. But my my first time in Japan, or one of my first times, not my first time, was I was on tour with Lady Gaga in in Asia. So we went through like most Asian countries, that and I was so bad. excited about Japan because it was like three shows, thirty three thousand people each, or something like that. Something crazy. And I'm like, oh my, it's sold out. I'm so excited. And I start playing and everybody's like, not moving an inch. Oh man. And I'm like, eh, like maybe culturally, am I wearing something wrong? I was so insecure. I didn't know what I was doing wrong. And then I'll be like, hands up. And everybody's like, <laughs> <laughs> very much into it. And the song is done. They're like, <laughs> ready for it next. Like you would, hear, you would hear a pin drop. It was so weird. I'm like, I don't understand what's going on. And then, over the years, Japan became the craziest crowd, the most expressive. Like, I feel like I saw an entire country open up yeah. and like show their emotions and like be free to do what they want to do. And that might be the coolest thing I've ever heard. It's it was incredible. Can and I, I remember I came of a country and culture and mm. expression. And, yes, and I came to Japan at least once a year, so I feel like I really frequently saw the little steps from. We've played a festival, and there was like I played in a ten thousand person um, like tent. 
And I remember like 10 minutes before I went on, they're like, we have to cut people off. It's too full. I'm like, damn, really? Like, people are really into this. That's so cool. And then people go crazy. I'm like, how oh, is this possible? Like a year ago, you guys were so like waiting. Like in school, yeah. It's incredible. Like I, maybe that's why I fell in love with Japan even more. Just to see people open up and be themselves is really, really amazing. I feel like I'm a 17-year-old kid asking surface-level questions. But There's no such thing. I just I have to do it. So, you know, DJ, it's the party. It's what people do. They party. They go see a DJ. Right. Do you drink? Do you, you know, I'm sure as somebody who's been performing since you were a young child, mm -hmm. kind of, I don't, I don't know if a reference or comparison to like a child actor, it can be in the same conversation. But as you got older, mm -hmm. became more popular, did you ever have a, a moment where you had to just slow down and say, man, I'm just living this lifestyle too much. I don't want to tour. And you got too far into partying or too right. far into girls. Like, was that ever something that you struggled with? I don't know. So my, my curve of being a DJ was the first two years I toured by myself. That's when I didn't even know cities in America. I would look like, oh, today I'm going to XYZ. I was like, oh, I don't even know where that is. And I would land by myself, no tour manager, nobody with me. Spoke English, but not well. And I just play my show and go back to my room and sleep and get ready for my next flight. Every day. Um, if I drank, it was just to be polite and like, I'll have a drink and then put it right back down. Right. And when I started having a team and have people travel with me, I was like, oh, now it's kind of, I'm a social drinker. I have never in my life drank by myself. It's just not something I crave, but I love having a drink with my friends. Like that's just Nothing something, better. it's amazing. Um, so I started definitely drinking more. And as crowds grew bigger and you know, I was more and more nervous, I realized that the just the run, uh, right amount of drink actually really helps me. Facts. Like I would have probably freaked out if I if I was entirely sober in New York when I met you. When you're like, oh, 90 seconds. I'm like, all right, guys. Like, <laughs> the reason I was chill is like it's gonna be fine. And and my my formula is one drink before I go on stage, and one drink on stage over the course of the 90 minutes, mm. two hours. So and I sweat a lot. I don't know the biology behind that, but I feel like when I get off stage, I'm not drunk. Yeah. Um, that's my formula for, for drinking. And of course, like in Vegas specifically, there's always somebody in Vegas. There's always a friend in Vegas. Oh, yeah. And we we do end up partying there. Not every time, but um, I've never felt like it got out of hand um, like some other people that I've yeah. noticed. It's just a dangerous course. lifestyle. It is. It is. Um, I don't know how much of it is kind of what we think DJs do and what they actually do because it's a lot of work like before the show usually if like friends are not in town it's like going through the set list like we have how many pyro shots eight okay let's do them on the second drop of this on the first drop of this like writing everything down everybody knows what to do like it's a lot of work it's not as much partying usually on tour tour bus tour the real ones i don't party at all um we typically play a show we record the show from front of house we get all back on the bus and we watch the show right after the show so it's like we take notes. Tape. Yeah, yeah, it's like, why did the lights turn blue here? We have to look into the code. That wasn't supposed to happen. Write notes, use the next day to program, play the show, get on the bus, watch the recording, get better. And usually after the very last show, you're like, we're good. Yeah. <laughs> we're ready. And yeah. then the tour's over. Are your parents still around? My parents live in Germany. Do you have a good relationship with them? I do, but we are not as, like, some of my friends t like FaceTime their parents every day. I'm not like that. We text. Yeah. And I'm then we, we FaceTime like once every few weeks or something yeah. like that. But I always text and obviously the time difference is another thing because they wake up at a different time than I do. And it ends up being like you have like four hours of a crossover. And of course. Oftentimes I'm busy during those four, four hours. But like texting is a really good thing because you reply when it's convenient to you and everybody knows. Our rule is FaceTime me anytime you want. If I'm busy, I won't pick up. If I'm free, I'll, I'll pick up, and everybody knows, and that's kind of how we how we do it. Yeah, the only reason I ask is you you just seem so grounded, and you have a great demeanor about mm. yourself, and I, I don't know why, but in some ways I associate that with, like, you had a good upbringing. Yeah, I mean, we grew up really poor, but maybe that's part of the reason why I appreciate things I have. Like, yeah, no, absolutely. I just meant, like, the love from your parents, not yeah, so much. Yeah, my like, parents have supported me always. And mm. supporting a child, like, I don't know, if somebody asked me, hey, I want to be a musician, should I do that? I'd be like, I don't know. I would have a hard time saying yes, knowing that your chance of succeeding is 0.01%. Yeah. I would have a hard time being, you know, trying to be rational, saying yes. But at the same time, always go for passion. Music has always been my brother and my, my passion. Um, 
and they supported it. Like I missed six weeks of school at a time back when I was in my band to record an album, and they were like, "Yeah, if you want to do That's that, awesome. let's do that." And they Good would they you. would always be behind me. And oh yeah, I'm sure I'm sure it made their lives easier when you were probably I'm sure a good kid and. Yeah, that I think was my I was. Thing with, with, with video games, I love playing video games. My parents knew that it was my passion, mm -hmm. right? I knew I wanted to get into this world in some capacity. I didn't know how. Yeah. And, um, and really what it came down to is like, if I was a good kid, if I was getting good grades, when I started getting to high school, I was working, mm -hmm. you know, babysitting, mowing lawns, doing this. Um, I was polite, you know, and, 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 and was holding social friendships and everything. If 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 for the last three hours of my free time that day, if I wanted to just play Halo, yeah, my my my, my parents are like, how could we tell him no? Yeah, he's, that's smart. He, I think. He's got everything else in order. Yeah. yeah, you know, then at that point, then you're just teaching, you know, negative things. Um, yeah, I, so. I agree. I think it's good if parents support. I mean, there's got to be some sort of guidance, of course, because yeah. if I look at myself at 15, I was like, I didn't know anything back then, you know, but I knew my passion, and I think parents should always try to fulfill children's passion like if, if somebody's so into cars like I'm, I'm not that into cars but if you're so into cars and you just love everything about it like let that child develop and, and see if maybe that is something that they want to do being a race car driver or whatever yeah. but what I'm wondering is with, with the two of you guys um, for me I remember making electronic music my grandma different generation but I always used to burn CDs of the stuff I make listen in the car and be like that's pretty good that's not good and it was just playing in the background while my, my grandma was in the car. And she's like, is this music? Do they call this music? And it's like, whoa. Right. That's oh, like yeah. that's a generational that's a completely gap. completely different generation. Mm -hmm. So I think when I became successful, my parents probably at first were like, I wonder what this guy's doing in America. Yeah. How was that for you guys? Because a musician is at least a job that people can easily understand because it's, you know, generations old. But I feel like professional gamer, esports streamer, those are all new things. Yeah. Like, do people did watch you play parent... video games? That's the. Why that's don't they the, just go play? I mean, video I watch games. it all the time, and yeah. people are like, "You watch other people play?" It's like, yeah. yes, I watch other people play. Mm -hmm. Is that something that your parents didn't understand at first, or was that like a natural transition? Yeah, there was definitely a hurdle. My mom hated it. I mean, yeah. she 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 literally made me go get a job when I was fifteen. I had to go to the dean's office get a workers' permit because in America you can't legally like get a job until you're sixteen without your parents permission or the school's permission she literally made me get that job so i would stop playing video games wow but my dad was always he would come home after work he'd ask me are you winning son and he was like, he was the meme yeah he was you winning son? <laughs> he would just really walk, I, every That's time awesome. i'd hear his truck pull up he'd walk upstairs he'd knock on my door open up he's like how's it going i'm like good all right <laughs> see you later yeah so it was never it, it was definitely a hurdle yeah. until i started making money and even yeah. when i started winning money they thought it was fake money like I'm waiting on this paycheck. I'm waiting on this prize earnings to be fulfilled by the publisher, whoever threw the tournament, and it'd wait like a month to get it. They're like, well, are you sure it was a legitimate league? And yeah, I'm like, yeah. mom, Kanye West performed after our tournament. <laughs> I, yes, the $100,000 is coming, I promise. <laughs> It'll but, be here at some point. Yeah, yeah I think it was difficult. That makes sense, right? Because ultimately, like, my, my grandma still asks if I have enough to eat. Like, it's just, I love that. it's a different generation, and I'm like, yeah. grandma... I promise you, yeah. I can afford food as much as I like. Yeah. It's just a different While your generation. Uber Eats is like showing up while you're sunbathing in your infinity pool. <laughs> oh, like, yeah, Grandma, I, I promise. <laughs> Wait. I'm good. I, I, I have something that I know, Matt, This you're, you're quite passionate about as well. Um, the other day, Anton, you showed off your shoe collection. Oh, word? And yeah. I don't know if collection is the word. It's, uh, it's a it's, store. <laughs> it's a shoe warehouse in your closet. Um, it's not that Matt also Matt also loves shoes. Um, do. and does unboxing videos. What is like your favorite? Do you have a favorite pair? Do you, like what? What? What are you looking at getting? Is there anything that comes to mind? The all-time greats. Which what I do is with. It's um, an Adidas Ultra Boost laceless. Mm. I think it's like V two or V three. Mm -hmm. Laceless is really important because the the regular ones are totally fine, and I have some of them. But I feel like in twenty twenty, the technology of how the material sits on your food, on food, foot, <laughs> not on my food, <laughs> makes laces so unnecessary. I feel like. I have certain pairs of shoes that sit better without laces than with laces. Mm. I'm, I don't know much about sneakers. That's more we are probably different. I look at them like, looks dope to me, buy it. And I end up wearing the same pair 90% of my year, and that's that pair. The yeah. Ultra Boost laceless. Ultra um, Boost were my favorite silhouette for a long time. That's what mm -hmm. made me start unboxing sneakers on YouTube. Because oh, really? I, when the V1s, the Ultra Boost came out, I bought like every single pair. Yeah. Um, and I think through that, ultra boost itself uh 
I never would buy Jordans when I was a kid because mm-hmm. I didn't think I could pull them off. Like I wasn't tall enough, and uh, you know, I I wasn't very athletic. I'm like, yeah, this ain't. They're not. Sorry, they're not man. gonna. They're not gonna buy this shit if I walk into school. They're not gonna buy my uh-huh. my persona that I'm trying to. And then when I got older, I was just like, fuck it, dude. Jordan ones are dope. I don't care if I'm five ten. I'm gonna wear them anyways. But Ultra Boost was a great. I think they overkilled it. Like Adidas, mm-hmm. they they just released too many colorways. And they oversaturated the market. It mm. didn't. It wasn't special anymore. Mm. I can see that when you get a, a sick pair. And I think Adidas has done that one too many times. They did it with the That's Yeezys. Fair. They did it with Ultra Boost. But Ultra Boost, great shoe, great yeah. silhouette. Uh, what are they called? NMDs. NMDs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's like my go-to. I would say, um, th- that I wear the most. I mean, I probably have pairs that are much more rare or whatever. But I just prefer comfortable shoes, um, that I can, you know, wear every day. Yeah. Do you have 500 pairs in your shoes, you think? I'm scared to find out. <laughs> Dude, I'm, I'm actually scared to I find could, out. That'd be a great YouTube it. video. I actually couldn't believe it because... I don't know how many pairs I have. Yeah. I'm I, scared to guess. I was I was blown away. I didn't know that. I didn't <laughs> I didn't know that about, yeah. that about you. That to be, you to that. be fair, tons of props to Nike because the majority of my beginning collection was all just Nike being amazing. I've, I've done some stuff with Nike in, in the past. And ever since I did one thing with them, they just sent me like monthly that's boxes awesome. of shoes and, and that's all I wore and they have my name on it and like really cool. And then I, when I bought my new house, I was like, well, I don't have a girlfriend or wife. There's like his and her. So I'm like, I do have shoes. <laughs> <laughs> I may do something. You might may do thing here. Oh, there you go. So, and then it went crazy. Then I discovered goat. I don't know of if you guys course. know yeah. the app and that ruined it. Cause Stop I go on Instagram, better. I go on Twitter Perfect. and then I, I kind of, Got bored going goat, and it's like Instagram, but you buy the pictures. It's like that shoe's awesome. Swipe. Yeah. Right? Oh. <laughs> it's like, what did I just goat do? got very dangerous for me early oh. on too. Oh, so, so I've got two questions. Now you talk about Nike; they put you on the list. You know, you talk about Adidas shoes. Uh, what is there? Is there one brand? If I had to put you on the spot right now, that you would love to have collaborate with Team Z? Like, what for you is the 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 golden goose, the diamond mm. that you're chasing? Like a designer brand, a lifestyle brand, a sports team. Like, wh- yeah. where would you like Pokemon. to end up? Pokemon. <laughs> Pokemon. It's a really good question because I like when I wear suits, it's completely different, right? It it there it might be Dior or something. Um, lifestyle every day. I love Adidas and Nike, and I love them both for the fact that they don't sweat me over wearing either or else something else you know they've never yeah. asked me do you mind wearing this during this and never not one single time neither of them asked but they're always you know i can choose anything i want essentially which i don't do because i discovered goat and i figured i don't have to ask and i prefer that but um i think making a collection with either adidas or nike would be a dream for me awesome um i love shoes to me a shoe is a piece of art and I sh- uh, showed my shoe room to my architect, who to me is also an artist. Like his architecture is phenomenal. And he walked mm-hmm. in, he's like, "Oh my god, this is this is incredible!" And not that he wears tons of shoes, but it's just that there's a certain art to a shoe. And I would love to be involved in designing one and like figuring out the shape. And I just I'm fascinated in in that kind of stuff and going into detail in anything. And I think one thing that I've always been was a perfectionist in anything I do. So anything I do, I always want to be the best at it. So. I would love to not just put my name on a shoe, but I would love to dive in and like see what I can do with it. Nike and Adidas, that. you heard it here first. Please let us let the bidding war begin. Hey, hit us on up. Um, you know, talking so much about you know your house, you have such a beautiful home. Thank you, thank you. You've got your Legos in the wall that everyone loves. <laughs> such yeah. a I saw that on Instagram. And that went super viral. Yeah, yeah. it did. And uh, but I know one thing that you've kind of done in quarantine, and we we had our moments of working out, but you you've gone. Yes. You've got hard in, in, yes. in your workouts. I mean, you look great. Thank you. Uh, Likewise. I can tell you put on, you know, a lot of muscle. Mm-hmm. And uh, the diet that we just mentioned, we, we brought up, you know, want, want any snacks or anything like that or any food. And you were like, oh, I'm on a really strict diet right now. Yeah. So I know this is kind of like a two-parter, but one, workout, you know, this is this the most you've ever worked out in your life? And mm-hmm. two, how much does it help to have a personal chef? And why should 100 Thieves get our house a personal chef? I see where you're getting at with that question. I'll start <laughs> with the first one. Hold up. Now, what? <laughs> I have never worked out this much, yes. Uh, mm. The reason is that I'm never home for seven months in a row. Like, yeah. usually, and everybody makes fun of me for that, I get sick every six to eight weeks. Like, I can look at my calendar and be like, I don't know if I can commit to this because I'm going to get sick 
in that month looking wow. at the schedule. Wow, scoot over. You know, <laughs> <laughs> no, literally, depending on my schedule, where I have to go, I can almost plan when I'm going to be sick. Wow. Uh, and you don't sleep much. I drink alcohol. The diet is shit. Like, let's be real. When it, when you finish at 3 a.m., you don't have the best choices possible. Oh, you eat um, chicken strips and burgers. 100% exactly what we eat. <laughs> That's exactly what That's we lifestyle. do. lifestyle. I'm trying to so, live. <laughs> <laughs> and since quarantine, I was like, wow, I could actually have a perfect, balanced day. I wake up at the same time every day. I go to bed at the same time. Um, I eat very healthy meals thanks to my chef, Jen O'Toole. Who is the best? Chef Jen, I'm a fan, by the way. If you ever I feel like see Jen this. has so many fans that she doesn't even know how many people see I've, her. I, I've messaged you about food you've posted on your yeah. story 25 times. <laughs> I joke every time I'm coming over to eat one yeah, day. Yeah, don't joke. And I'm going to show happen. up one day. Yeah, that's I mean, fine. Well, I, I planned on it, but then COVID happened. But at yeah. this point, I'm about to just quarantine for two weeks, get tested, and then I'm going to move in. There you go. Up. I have space. Stream and Guess what? I have space. Great. You but, offered um, me to drive one of your cars a couple weeks ago. I might take you up on that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, I'm much healthier than I've ever been, by the way. You got the whoop. You know about the whoop. Uh, 100%. What is that? Okay, I, I didn't know until oh, recently. I got to put you on this, man. Yeah. That You you can talk about it. Go ahead. You, well, yeah. I'm new to it. I'm like two weeks in, but okay. um, I saw my friend have it, and he saw it. He saw Joe Rogan wear it, and then I started doing my research, and I wanted to get better at fitness and I wanted to gain muscle, lose fat, all these things. And Whoop is basically like an Apple Watch, but it's got no face. Yeah. Uh, so you leave it on 24-7. The genius part is it lasts five days and you charge it by essentially putting a face watch on top of it for like 90 minutes and then it's charged for another five days, yeah, which is awesome. Yeah, it's awesome. And it's very precise. Like the Apple Watch I love for many reasons, but mm -hmm. when it comes to really – because with my chef, we were like, okay, we want to have currently a 500 calorie deficit from my food to my workout. And I was like, I don't know if I can really trust the Apple Watch with that because sometimes you start a workout, you get a call, you're on a call for an hour and it's like, you burned 600 calories. I'm like, I didn't. Yeah. I was just on a call. I said, no, I said I'm working out, but I am not. So yeah. I feel like the whoop is a little bit more if your heart rate doesn't go up, it's like, yeah, you didn't burn anything. Yeah. yeah. And the whoop will also track your sleep. So you wear yes. it while you're sleeping. Basically, this isn't an ad for Whoop, but it, I I've used it for like weeks at a time, and then I forget to charge, and then I take it off because mm -hmm. I haven't been working out. But you wear the Whoop twenty four seven. It's waterproof. It'll track your sleep from start to finish. Mm -hmm. It'll tell you how many times you woke up or how many disturbances you had, and it'll also taking into account the sleep that you've gotten and the amount of calories that you've burned in the last few days. It'll give you uh, a recovery number, and it'll tell you like okay. Uh, tracking all these things that we have for you, you're 90% recovered and you, you right. are set to perform at optimal levels today. I gotta get this from Maddie. So when you work out, you can keep your app open and it literally shows you like a little graph and it tells you you're in an optimal level. If you want to go be uh, beyond that, you can strain yourself a little bit more, but that also needs, uh, then you need to recover, which means you need more sleep. So it will say, you tell it when you have to wake up, and it tells you if you want to perform the next day, you have to go to bed at one or at two or That's at three. Awesome. Yeah, it's wow. really it's and I've been really technology. I've been following it, and I I realized that through Whoop, also no sponsorship or anything. I'm just I just really like it, but yeah. I ended up sleeping way more. Mm. And sleep is so damn important. People, I don't know, people function on four hours a day because people do some do function, but I've been sleeping close to nine hours a day. Um, since I got the whoop strap because I, I want to have a perfect score. Yeah, <laughs> you know what? And that's what's beautiful about it. Is that they, they, yeah. they, you know, in a lot of ways, these apps that track calories and track the Apple Watch with how many calories you burn, it's, uh, it's gamified sleeping, right? Mm. Because you're like, this fucking number won't go back up. Like, I want you to be at 100. And yeah. You're like, I need to go. I get my ass in bed right now. Yeah. You should get one. And it, the, 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 the band Maddie is free. Sure. Just pay for the, the, the membership. They send it to you. Really quick, uh, we're, 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 we're talking. This is one of our best episodes we've ever had on the Courage and Eight Shot Show with how fluid the conversation is. <laughs> forgot to give a shout out to our second sponsor. As you guys know, Chipotle always shows so much love to the Courage and Eight Shot That's Show. In this Valorant, man. Uh, and yeah, we're going to get into the video games next. Uh, Chipotle just rolled out their new real food print, the first transparent sustainability tracker of its kind, showing the sustainable oh. impact. You're helping make on the planet mm. by choosing Chipotle's real ingredients versus conventional ones. They know that one burrito may not change the world, but the way but the way they make it might. Uh, it's super cool. You can check it out when you order a chicken bowl, carne asada tacos, or your favorite burrito from the Chipotle app. All you have to do is build your order, and your real food print will be calculated. Shout out to Chipotle for everything they do, not only with us at 100 Thieves, but uh, they're tr truly trying to make an impact on the world. So 
as you guys know, we we absolutely love Chipotle. So I've made Chipotle burritos before. What would you say? I've made Chipotle burritos before. Ooh, yeah. Yep. I made the guac too. I like Wait, stood in there and actually, I lie. I didn't really make it. I handed them out. That's awesome. Oh, that's, Either that's, way, that's Chipotle. I mean, Chipotle is Chipotle. my second home away from home. Uh, Matt, you just referenced the Valorant match. Unfortunately, we just lost, but that's fine. This team TSM has been around since the launch of the game. Ours has been around for two TSM, and a half weeks. We're coming for two and a half weeks. Yeah, we, uh, that team was that team was re- that team was just formed what like two three weeks ago. Well, like oh. three weeks fully with the five. Yeah, no, wow. I mean we got some young kids too. They're seventeen years old. They need that's time amazing. to grow and, and build awesome. experience. So, I, I mean, this match really didn't matter. We're just receding, but. I'm proud of the progress that they're making for sure. Yeah. And you've been playing a ton of Valorant. So much. We actually talked about it quite a bit uh, before we did the podcast. You started in CSGO, then you went to Overwatch. Now you're on Valorant. Are you gonna are, are you gonna be what is it, Radiant? I don't is- know if I can reach Radiant. I think you can. If I take a month off, I can. <laughs> I might. Uh, <laughs> I mean do whatever I, you want. You're rich. My, my goal is to get uh, <laughs> immortal. I'm one rank away. I can definitely do it. Okay. Four right. four wins in a row and you got you got it. I, I totally believe you can. And you know, then we, I can play with Hiko, and then maybe then I will actually. <laughs> <laughs> See, we, can go, we can go find him after this. You might, you can hang around. I'm sure they'll be uh, gaming. But no, we we joke because you know when this game came out, I thought I was going to be so into it, and I know we, mm-hmm. we talked about playing a lot. I think we faced each other um, in the very beginning, in right? Very very beginning, yeah, like yeah, week yeah. week one. Yeah. Um, but then I wound up falling out of it just because. They had the drops on Twitch. They didn't have them on YouTube. So, like, launch day, I was like, here we go. Viewership's going to be crazy. Oh. And then I was the lone boy out on YouTube that had I didn't a realize fifth that. of my normal viewership because everyone flooded to Twitch to try to get into the beta because it was hidden behind these drops. So, you were with YouTube at the point when it... Um... Yeah, I've been in... Uh, this week, it marks one year of streaming exclusively on YouTube. Got it, so, got it. at that point, I was like, I just can't hemorrhage my Hard whole justify, audience huh? just to justify it. But I definitely love those competitive type shooters but this isn't the first shooter like this you played i mean i mean you played a lot of overwatch but what else stands out to you like in your gaming world what are like your staples the one that really <clears throat> got me into competitive gaming was it was actually see a source oh okay. a long time ago oh i looked God. it up like there's some leftover accounts of me somebody tweeted me that remembered playing against me in a team because i used to play in a team i was even younger than 17 i'm pretty sure at that point i was like 15 or 16 I played that like 12 hours a day, and if there was an important match, yeah, then I was sick the next day. And you know what I mean? Like I would, oh yeah, I, I took it like quite seriously. I drove to land parties and like the whole did the whole thing. Wow. Um, I was really into it for many years before my career took off. Mm. Uh, and um, then I didn't have a PC forever. Um, and then uh, <laughs> when I moved to my new house, I got a PC and I got hardcore into Overwatch. Mm. Like I played Overwatch on PS4, but it's kind of I'm not good enough with a controller and these kinds of games, which is I don't understand how you can be. That's like that's crazy to me. Yeah. It's like playing with a mouse pad that's this big. Well, it's 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 the same. I mean, if you put me in FL Studio or whatever Fair. program you use to make music, mm-hmm. it'd be like a different language to me. So but you learn with time. You, you, you learn. learn. Yeah. But yeah, I got really into Overwatch. Um, and then this game came out, and I was like, oh, my God, it sounds like a mix of both games. Like, the one that, that really has CS. my heart forever. Like, yep. Counter-Strike, if you put me on the spot, it's like, what's the best game of all time? For me, Counter-Strike is the best game oh, of yeah. all time. For me, personally. And then Overwatch, I absolutely love, but it just made me so damn angry. Um, <laughs> so, so I was like, Valorant could be the right compromise. And so they had a baby. I was, I'm so love hooked. child. <laughs> yeah. It's really, I mean, I absolutely love it. I love how hardcore it is. Overwatch is really forgiving. You can play and be like, what? Yeah, no, I'm good. No, I'm Reinhardt. I'm fine. Yeah, yeah you know I'm what I mean? My <laughs> yeah, up. my shield's up. Um, Valorant is like, you look away and you're dead. Every, de- like every death and every kill matters. And yeah, I love it. What's interesting yeah. about you too is that I, there's a tons of uh, music artists and athletes that say they play video games and then you get online with them and it's like they never held a controller. Or yeah, they yeah. Never you can tell by their microphone, bro. That they uh, yeah. So I, I have a ton of respect that you, you know, you're able to... Uh, carry yourself in such a successful way in your 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 main career, but are, are still really good at video games. It's 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 awesome, actually. And no joke, video games are part of the reason why I can be creative. And I remember it specifically when I was working on Stay, and that took a little while to get perfect. Mm-hmm. I would spend the first half of the day, like until 9 p.m. or so. I was in the studio working on the song, and 9 o'clock, I'm like, boom, time to play Overwatch. And I go and I game and I don't think about anything else because that's my like kind of reward. 
for mm-hmm. working hard. And I really noticed that separating my day, I used to be in the studio for 12 hours every single day with no exception, would go to the gym at 1 a.m. and go to bed and that's it. Yeah. Um, that's not really a way of living for me. Like I love making music, but I realized how much more there is to life other than your work. Mm-hmm. So gaming was like, okay, now I can work and then set aside time to, you know, for my hobby. And then it feels like, it feels more rewarding. And then, um, yeah, so gaming has been like a really, really big part of my life. And like you said, I see it all the time. It's like, yeah, he's a big gamer. I'm like, really? Uh, let's find yeah. out. <laughs> like, oh, come on. Bro, let's see it. Let's see it. I can't imagine the toxicity of that lifestyle. And we're coming up on an hour here. We'll get you out of here soon. But, no, it's all good. No rush. Uh, I, feel, I feel like, you know, we asked a lot of questions about being a DJ, the experience of being a DJ. But I can't even fathom the pressure one might put on themselves to continue to produce and create <laughs> music that will live on forever, right? Yeah. That standard that you must put in your own mind and then in the studio 12 hours a day, at a, at a, at a certain point, there must be a level of toxicity there where oh, you're yeah. just like pulling your hair out, trying to create something that you love and you might not just be able to make it over that peak of the mountain or mm-hmm. see that horizon of something <laughs> that you're just passionate about and it's beautiful and it seems... From from my standpoint, not knowing a, a ton about music creation and, and the process of which you go through, you've been very transparent with your fans online, yeah. like what you need to do, what's best for you, mm-hmm. when they can expect music. Yep. Is, is, is that something that's sort of therapeutic for you to put it out there and let people know like, hey, don't expect anything for a while. I'm, I'm taking my time on this one. It It is. And I did that not a long time ago and it felt really good. Um what you described is is very real. Like I remember in the period between my first two albums when I was in the studio 12 hours a day, um, let's just say the way you produce, you have an idea. Like just imagine it to make it simpler for listeners. Like I want to mold this car and I have this idea for this cool shape. But to mold this car, it's really difficult. And it'll take you six hours and it might look like shit and you might be like, mm, scrap that. Crumble up but the paper, throw it out. But every single time you build a test car, and it's not successful, it crushes your morale. Or for me, it does. And it got to the point where I had so much anxiety of even trying out an idea because I would not want to fail that I I noticed that because I was in the studio all day playing Hearthstone, just trying to distract myself from mm. actually getting the work done because I was so scared of failing. Um, and it's all in your mind. Like You have to realize what's going on. And I was like, okay, I need to set time aside to let myself live because what's the point of being there for 12 hours if I don't get shit done? So I took like one day off. I went to look at a bunch of houses just for fun. I love architecture. Come back the next day and I finished the song. And I was like, huh, I didn't have to suffer through this like anxiety all day long. I can just take time off, let myself rest and recover and come back strong. And that was a really important lesson. Yeah, no, 100%. I feel like taking a step away from anything uh, just allows yourself to let your mind wander in places that it not normally would uh, when you're sitting in the studio. Yep. And, you know, in a very smaller uh, environment, I feel very similar to you w- with YouTube. I took a, a lot of breaks, mm-hmm. and those breaks helped me more so than anything I could have ever done because I'm just putting too much pressure on myself to be perfect. You know, I, I have one last thing here. Um, I know my mom would be upset if I didn't bring it up, but when you cut your hair, my mom texted me and said, Oh, Zed looks so cute with his short haircut, kissy emoji, hard eyes. <laughs> that sounds like oh. Lisa Dunlap. Um, yeah, so I just wanted Mom. to share that. Yeah, and my dad's out there, Dad. <laughs> um, but no, so so it, the long hair versus short hair. <laughs> Pros and cons, is the long hair ever going to come back? Do your fans like one more than the other? Where, and, then, and then we'll let you go. I am quite embarrassed of my long hair. Really? Yeah, I see these people have long hair. I'm like, God, that looks good. I kind of want that. Oh God, that's and the good. other thing was like, can I do it? I've tried like three times, and it gets to this weird length where like I cannot do this anymore. Yeah. Chop it off. I feel that. So I wanted to know, can I do this? Like, We've had meetings where I'm like, I want to have long hair. And I was like, yeah, let's go. And then I just can't do it. So I was like, I'm doing it. I'm mm-hmm. doing it. Nothing can stop me. Not even looking terrible. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it started with... It was just a little longer, and I put a man bun up, Mm -hmm. and it was a joke. I thought like everybody would laugh at me. Posted it, and everybody and everybody was like, "Oh my god, that looks so good!" I was like, "What? (laughs) How does that look good?" But (laughs) but if you really think so, I'm gonna keep going. Yeah. So I kept going. I kept going, and then in the moment, I thought like I look kind of badass. I and then I thought it's easier 
because you don't have to like usually I style my hair. I haven't styled my hair in like literally seven months. I don't know what's going on up here looks right good, now, but um, I would spend time like styling my hair, blow drying and everything. And I was like, how good it must be to have long hair, which is like, I'm, I'm alive. That's all it is. Yeah. <laughs> and um, it was to a certain extent. And then it's like always in your way and annoying. And I, I chopped it off and I was like, oh, it looks kind of good. I look kind of younger. And when I look back at my last year and a half of growing my hair, two years, I'm, I'm embarrassed. Wow. So I would not go back. Out. But like it was a it was a thing. It was a period. Everybody, I mean, Justin Timberlake had the the blue jean outfit. We've seen yeah, it. You know what I mean? Um, everybody goes through these phases. And for me, I look back and I'm like, I should not, I should not do this again. Mm. I should not okay. do this again. That, the human brain is a funny thing because it always tell you, man, what the hell were we thinking yeah. years ago? But I, I totally get that. Zed, listen, man, uh, I know this was your first podcast. You're holding out for the Joe Rogan. Uh, experience. Hopefully we're better I don't, than Joe. No, no, I think I think uh, what's what I find interesting so much about you is that there's guests that we'll have on, and once we get to an hour, I'm like, all right, clip it and ship it. Let's get it up on YouTube. Mm -hmm. I feel like I can sit here, have a couple drinks with you, and ask you uh, just a number of questions. I mean, the experiences that you must have had and traveling as much as you have, the people that you've been around, and uh, man, I feel like there's so much more for Joe Rogan to ask about. So. <laughs> no, this was I, I'm I'm really honored that you guys had me. And uh, what you said earlier was really true: is we don't give enough time for ourselves to think. I feel like thinking or talking for no other purpose than you know having a conversation is something we don't do enough. Oh yeah, like this was really great for me. I get to reflect. It's almost like meditation. Yeah, absolutely. I say something absolutely. and I reflect it. And I'm like, huh, it's really like this. Like I would have never thought that if we never expressed ourselves so of thank you that's, for that. i see a lot of similarities in which streaming sometimes i'll be having a bad day i don't want to stream i get online start talking to my chat they start asking me questions and endorphins just start uh -huh. flooding and that's one thing i love about paris one thing that america doesn't do well is listen when you go to a restaurant they're trying to get in and out as fast as possible you go to lunch or dinner in paris you're sitting there for two hours Burning a cigarette down. You got to slow down. Drinking some wine. S slow down, you crazy child. child. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, let's let's no, save this thing. Yeah. yeah. Mm, excuse me. Uh, Zed, I appreciate you so much, man. Yeah. This has been Thank an incredible guys. episode. I feel like there's so many things we could have asked about. You got to write a book one day. Not to put too much pressure on you, but no, uh, thank fun. you everyone for tuning in to the Courage and Aid Shot Show. Remember, if you're watching the YouTube video, hit the thumbs up button. Uh, go check out Zed. He's you know he's got new, new song. music on the way. Yeah. He said the album's not coming for a while, but he's got a new song. So you go listen to that. We have information in the description below. Go check out his stream whenever he's going to get to that. Uh, and I think that's going to do it. Shout out to uh, Cash App and Chipotle for all always being incredible sponsors to this show. Hope you guys have a fantastic day. And YouTube, we'll see you fudging later. Come on.